All right, well, welcome to the Sunday School session for our missions conference. Um, we'd like to welcome Jesse back up and anxious to learn more about their ministry in Liberia and uh, a time for questions and answers, too. So, Jesse, come on up. All right, well, if, if you wanted to get rid of me, you failed. I'm back. Um, so um, I'm not going to be doing much of a, a lesson today as much of, as, as I am going to be just sharing what it is we're involved in um, in Liberia. Hopefully we can all take some lessons from it. I don't know. We'll see. Um, so we are the Phillips family. Um, this is us. Uh, Job is in the middle. He's, uh, he was adopted in uh, July of 2018, 2019. And Samira was born, the next on the left, Samira, uh, she was born in August of 2019. And now we have Caius, who was just born in January. We had a little bit of a scare with him and had to go to the NICU and um, but everything's okay, and God provided and took care of us, so this is our happy little family. We moved to Liberia in uh, 2015, December of 2015, uh, which was right after the Ebola epidemic. I don't know if you remember very much about that, but Jess and I actually, um, Jessica had always had a, a heart for missions, and she really had a heart for Africa, and even throughout high school, junior high, high school, she really knew that she was going to be in Africa. Myself, I did not. Um, I had some other plans for my life. Um, and so through our relationship and um, through me seeing the passion that she had for the Lord and the willingness for her to sacrifice, um, it really actually um, encouraged me to do the same. And so for all you ladies out there, young, young ladies, be strong, uh, <laughs> because it, it, it can pay off, and, uh, and I will say that after moving to Liberia, you know, we wouldn't change anything, or we love what we do, we love our life. Um, I was going to go be a pilot in the Air Force, um, and, uh, and I would have loved that, but I would not trade anything for what I have today, and so, um, so we're in Liberia. Uh, we moved to Liberia not having really any idea what God wanted us to be involved in. Um, we uh, we had, connect, had connections with a Liberian-led organization, um, and we were planning to go and volunteer in the, in the school and the orphanage, and that was really what we had planned to do in Liberia until God told us different. Um, and it was about a year in that we lived in Liberia, that, um, that he did finally tell us and provide a direction for where he wanted us to go. And if any of you are familiar, um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the Vermeer, Vermeer plant in Pella, uh, but one of the things they helped to design and build was a compressed earth machine. Um, and early on in our ministry in Liberia, I had reached out and um, God connected me with a lot of different people, and we had found out that actually one of those machines, actually the first one off of the production line was in Liberia, and it had landed in Liberia uh, about a year before we even moved there, um, and we found out that the, um, the family or the couple that was coming to operate it with uh, the, the uh, Baptist Seminary of Liberia they actually were called by God to go somewhere else. And so that machine had literally been sitting there doing nothing because nobody had any idea how to run it. And so we agreed with this organization. We said, we'll come back and we'll come back to the States. We'll go take the training in Texas. Um, and we'll come back if you let us use it for one little project for the ministry we were working with. We will train your people and we will let you go ahead and, and you know, it's yours. We came back and we followed the Lord. We paid for this training. We went to it in Texas, and uh, on the on the flight, we land, we were in uh, New York Airport on the way over to Liberia. We got a call from the organization that said we really feel like God is asking us to just give you this machine, um, and we really feel like God's going to use you to to uh, to do great things in Liberia with it. 
That was a big one. This machine is about a $30,000 machine, along with shipping is about $50,000. Um, and at the time, Jess and I were living on a very, very small budget, <laughs> uh, usually about $500 to $1,000 a month. And uh, we did not have the, the money to buy something like this. And so that was a huge uh, sign from the Lord. We felt like the Lord was calling us into kind of going this direction. And so um, the very next year, we actually were able to raise some money um, to produce some of these compressed earth bricks, um, which is using soil, uh, mostly soil, and then it uses a par uh, partial uh, sand and cement to stabilize the mixture. Um, and so we actually did this. We raised some money, and as we were doing the production, we realized that there was a huge ministry in this production. And so um, as, we, um, as we were producing, myself, I was working with the, with the men, and Jessica, uh, with her skill of being able to, to listen and hear Holy Spirit and be able to listen and hear what's going on uh, around, um, we were actually able to really do some excellent ministry with the men that we used, that we hired to produce the bricks. Um, we were able to connect with them in ways that we had never been able to connect with Liberians before because we were actually physically doing the work with them and we were actually doing life with them. We lived with them. We visited their villages. We visited their homes. Um, we had them come visit us. We spent lots of time in discussion and we realized, wow, this is actually, you know, there's, there are so many, um, so many deep questions that these people have um, about Jesus, about the church, that now we get, to actually, um, we get to actually pull those questions out by doing life with them. And so we were really excited by the ministry that was involved there. Um, we were really afraid about the cost of operating such a thing and having to raise all of that support um, because it would have cost lots and lots of money to keep a machine like that going. And so as Jess and I were praying, we thought, well, um, maybe we can do this as a business. Maybe we can do this as kind of a break-even business where um, we can employ Liberians um, and we can do projects and we can also use it as discipleship and use it as a way to train other builders and um, really be able to do life with the construction uh, 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 side, the construction community of Liberia. And so we prayed about it. We felt like that was what God was asking us to do and um, all of a sudden, I get an email from another ministry on the other side of Liberia that said, hey, um, I've been really trying to find this, find this machine. I'm really interested in it. Would you come and produce some bricks for us? And we said, absolutely, we'll come. And so that was our first contract that we did as a, as, as a business. And uh, as we were moving our machine to that location, um, I get a call from the original organization that had sent the original machine. I get a call from him and he said, hey, um, if I could get you another machine, what would you do with it? And I said, oh, great. This is a pastor. I'm telling him I'm going to use it as a business and he's going to tell me to go home. Um, and as I told him that very quietly and shyly, um, he, all of a sudden, he paused, and he all of a sudden came back, and he said, wow, that's weird. And I said, what, what do you mean? He said, well, about a week ago, I received an email from a woman I don't know who told her, or God told, said that God told her that she was to provide one of these machines for somebody, and she reached out to me, and I said, well, the only people I know are in Liberia, and she said, that God told her she was to buy this machine for somebody to use as a business in Liberia. Uh, so, of course, at that point, we were like, okay, God, apparently this is where we're supposed to, this is what we're supposed to do. Um, so that's a little bit of a backstory of how we got involved in what we're involved in. It wasn't like uh, Jess and I just kind of came together and said, yep, we are going to go and do this. This is, what we're, this is our plan. We actually moved to Liberia without any clue whatsoever, really, what God was asking us to do. And we really felt at that point, um, like Abraham, when God said, when God told Abraham, leave your, leave your family, leave your mother and father and go to the place that I will show you. 
um, he didn't act, God didn't actually tell them exactly where to go. He said, go to the place, I will show you. And so we felt God was asking us to go. We went, and along the way, God has provided those, um, those small pieces for us to kind of follow and, and be a part of, of what he's planned in Liberia. Um, so to give you a little overview, so Liberia is in West Africa. If you can see in the red, it's a little tiny country. It's about the size of the state of Kentucky. Um, the population of Liberia is a little over 4 million. Um, and the city of Monrovia, the capital, the population is actually a little over 2 million. So more than half of the country lives in, in the one uh, capital of Monrovia. And then the rest um, are in villages. It takes... Um, Liberia, the size of Kentucky, it takes probably, depending on the weather... Uh, three or four days to actually drive from one side to the other because of the roads and because of um, the conditions involved in doing that. And so a lot of ministries, even one that we um, are actually just became involved with, um, they're all the way in the southeast of Liberia, and they actually have, have to use a plane to get there. They actually fly in a plane to get where they're going. Um, so Liberia is uh, not a... It doesn't have a lot of animals. It's not like the countries you think of, like South Africa and Kenya and Uganda, where you can go on safari and see all the giraffes and elephants and, and lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Um, there's actually very few animals in Liberia because of overhunting and over things like that. Um, there are, a, a, and I'm answering, I'm saying this because a lot of times that's the questions that we get. So I'm just kind of going over that um, to start with. Um, there are, so 80% of the country is under the age of 18. Um, because of a civil war uh, starting in uh, 1989 and going on until about 2010-ish, um, that pretty much just completely decimated the, the older population. Um, and a lot of, the, a lot of those uh, kids that are now actually Jessenai's age were child soldiers in the war. And so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of PTSD, a lot of trauma that has not been dealt with in Liberia. Um, if, um, to give you a little idea of, so Liberia was actually started by um, freed slaves from the, from the United States. There was a, a, a society called uh, the American Colonization Society right after, um, the, the, right after our Civil War that actually had a plan to send uh, freed slaves back to Africa to help them start and uh, have their own country. And so that's how Liberia started. So Liberia as a government actually follows um, American, uh, so they have, they have the three branches of government, they have a constitution that's very similar, um, there's a lot more corruption involved, there's a lot more tribal um, stuff going on, but it does uh, look a lot like, like the United States. It is, it is the United States of, of Africa uh, as pertains to the government, not necessarily as pertains to the uh, the standard of living. Liberia is, uh, I don't know what it is this year, but it's in it's in the top ten of of the poorest countries in the world. Um, it's actually the the worst country in Africa to do business in because of all the corruption, um, and so there's there's lots of poverty, normal. Uh, average income of the standard population is somewhere around a dollar a day. Um, and um, so that's what we are working in. Um, this is um, a picture of partially what we do. So our organization is called For the Lamb. And one of the reasons we called it that is because we, um, we felt like... Um, God was asking us to be an encouragement to those that were in their own fields, whether they were mothering their children, whether they were at work, that everything they do is for Jesus, is a rep being a representation of Jesus. We use um, Philippians 1.21 where Paul says, for me to live is Christ and for me to die is gain. And so our entire life is to be a representation of Jesus Christ. And so that was why we called our organization For the Lamb. Um, uh, to remind us and to remind others that we are to, uh, that we are to um, be representatives of Christ wherever we are. 
whether we're at the grocery store or whether we're at a concert somewhere, or whether we're at home or whether we're watching our kids, um, that we are to represent Christ wherever we are. Um, these are some of the projects that we've done. So to give you a little background, we actually have, um, um, we have a team in Liberia that we have trained to produce um, these, these bricks that actually are not really being produced in Liberia. Uh, most of the construction there is uh, a bunch of mud packed together. Um, uh, the other side is they, they use uh, what they call cement bricks. A lot, they look like cinder blocks, but they actually just pretty much dissolve in the, in, the, in the rain and you can pretty much break them. So these bricks are actually much more higher in, uh, in compression strength uh, and much more durable. Um, and so we're using this to actually uh, kind of a few different things, and I'll share, share that with you uh, down lower. But those are, that's a picture of some of the projects we've done. Um, these are our people up in the top right. You're going to see our production team. It's about a 12, sometimes 15-man team that um, our original thought was we were actually going to use the people in, the, in every area that we, uh, that we did our project. And then we found these, this crew, and we really felt like God was asking us to do more life with them. And, and so uh, this crew's been with us for the last, actually since we started, probably three years since we really got going. Um, and uh, so they all come with us. Uh, we do life with them. We do daily discipleship with them. Um, we, I do one-on-one -on -one discipleship with them. Um, so the main key things is we're teaching them how to be better fathers in their home, how to be better leaders in their community, um, and how to be better representatives of Christ. Um, and so that's our production team. On the bottom right, uh, you probably can't see it very well, but anyway, on the bottom right is Joseph. Joseph is my right-hand man. He's the guy that pretty much runs all of the this, uh, everything, especially while I'm gone, but even while I'm there. Um, Joseph is an excellent guy. God really just plopped us into our lap. Uh, on the top left, um, that is Abraham. Um, and on the bottom left, if you can see, that's Guza. His name is uh, David Guza. He's actually one of our contractors. So another side of what we do is we have our production team that produces the blocks. And then what we've done is we actually take on uh, Liberian construction contractors. So the, they have their own business, they have their own crews, and what we do is we do workshops with them on how to do business better. We teach them how to do business at, with a Christian mindset, and so, um, and, and we teach them a lot of new skills and new, uh, new ways to construct that are going to be more durable and more quality control. But Guza has been with us for a while as well, um, and he's even actually from some of the things that we've done with him, he's actually conducted trainings of his own with his own people. And so um, it's been really cool to see his business um, uh, kind of evolve as we've had relationship with him to become more and look more like Jesus. And so um, there's a lot of business practices now that they have brought in because of the relationships that we've had and they understand now. One of the things in Liberia, there's a huge... A population of Lebanese Middle Eastern people in Liberia. Um, they've come and they basically control the entire business sector. So Lebanese uh, is right there in the Middle East. You know, there's been a lot of war there, um, but there's a lot of business people that are in Liberia and they control the business sector of Liberia and their business practices are very, are terrible. They treat their employees horribly. Um, you can't trust them. Um, there's a lot of stigmas on them, but there's a lot of them are true in, in terms of business. And so the Liberian business people have kind of just followed suit. They've kind of just said, well, they do it this way, and they are, they're dishonest, and, and they steal from their people, and they don't pay their employees well, and they don't take care of their people, so why should I? And so that's uh, one thing that we're trying to get rid of, at least in our own little sphere of influence, and we feel like Guza is doing an excellent job at kind of transforming his business to be more, um, uh, more like Jesus and more representative of Jesus. Guza is actually also a lay pastor at his church, and so he preaches at his church. Um, I do some one-on-one -on -one discipleship with him a lot, and there's a lot of things in his actions that come out on the construction field that I get to actually call out, you know, and I get to speak to, and I wouldn't be able to 
in any other situation because he's, he's you know, in the church, he's going to be putting his face on. But when we're out in the community, when we're actually doing the construction and some of these, some of these sins kind of pop out, um, we get to discuss it and we get to talk about it. And it's been really great to be able to do that. Um, yeah, so there's, there's three things that we, um, that we focus, focus on. The first thing, of course, is the construction aspect. So we, uh, provide, so we get to provide quality, quality construction materials and practices for other ministries um, as well as local people there. Um, we get to do workshops and training with the people that are under us. So we do workshops with our contractors in construction, but also in better business practices and also in evangelism. And so we do, um, uh, we do all kinds of workshops and work with them. We do business training. Um, so we train uh, our contractors as well as other businesses, again, how to do business as, with a Christian mindset and how to use their business as a ministry, how to use their business to reach their, um, their customers and to reach their employees and to reach the communities that they serve. Um, so that's a big problem, and I want to kind of address this uh, to start off with. Um, the church in Liberia is very much, um, very much uh, ritualistic in the way that they do things, very much um, um, not necessarily uh, relationship-based, but very much more um, ritualistic-based. And so, so the, the religion is more important to them. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that they kind of put face. So they, they dress up really nicely and they don't really like people to know what's, what they're doing. They don't like people to know their sin, but there's actually a lot of sin within the church, even in the leadership. There's a lot of, um, a lot of sexual sin, a lot of, um, a lot of drunkenness, a lot of things that happen even within the leadership of the church. And the other thing that is, is that the church is kind of viewed as um, a lot like we view the church here. Um, the church is kind of viewed as... Um, you need to serve me, or you need to take care of me. Um, the church is viewed as the way that we, the way that we share Jesus in the community is through the church. So, if the church is not doing a program, or if the church is not doing an outreach, or if the church is not doing this, then I'm not really individually in my own home or in my own community reaching people for Jesus. So, it's all done through the church. And so, um, so one of the things that we have really started to try to encourage and, um, and push people to understand is that they are part of the church, they are part of the body, and that wherever they are, they are representing not only Christ, but they're also representing their church and their body. And so they don't need their church to be doing something because God has placed them in a sphere of influence to be a representative right where they are. Um, and so that's one big thing that we, that we do, especially with our business training. And then, of course, we provide employment opportunities, um, good employment opportunities. So, um, so we actually pay our people uh, almost twice um, the, the standard pay in the country. Um, so our, our unskilled workers are, are, getting paid, are getting paid $10 to $12 a day, which is quite a bit for, for there. Um, and, the, and then our, our um, skilled workers are getting paid up to $15 or $20. Um, which is which is really good for for where they're at. Um, so employment opportunities during dry season, which is about six months out of the year, uh, we we employ anywhere from fifty to a hundred people um, during a dry season while we're doing production and construction. So we have lots of different projects going on. We have lots of different productions going on, and during that, we actually have team members that are doing devotions. Uh, daily devotions with all of those people that are hired, that are a part of the project, um, and um, we actually didn't institute this. But while we were gone, the first project while we were gone, we actually heard reports from the customer that the um, the uh, construction employees were actually evangelizing in the community uh, when they weren't working, and so that was really encouraging to us. Um, so next thing down is discipleship. I think I've already really kind of hit on that. Daily devotions, weekly Bible studies, and then we also do one-on-one -on -one discipleship. And the really good thing about that is we get to actually do life with these people, and so we get to see and kind of call out some of the, some of the wrong thinking and some of the sinful thinking um, and sinful actions. 
when uh, if we weren't doing this, we wouldn't be able to see that. Our heart for Liberia is to see the church become more a part of the larger church. Right now in Liberia, the church is very much dependent on the West, very much uh, anytime my skin or somebody else from the West comes, they, they really depend on getting money and whatever they can from, from that uh, situation. And one of the things that we have really, we have a heart for is encouraging the church, the people as well as the church, um, to, to, find, to see where their place is in the body of Christ and to take that place. Um, West Africa is actually um, majority Muslim. Liberia is known as a Christian country. It's actually at this point about 50-50 Christian and Muslim. Um, but uh, the other thing about West Africa is it's a majority French-speaking and so, um, not only is it more difficult for somebody like us to go there, not just on that side, but they view Westerners in these other countries a lot differently than in Liberia. And so, there's a lot less welcome involved. Um, and so, the, uh, the opportunity for Liberians to actually, the Liberian church to actually go into these other countries and be able to evangelize and reach um, is actually much better than for any of us to go. Because as soon as our skin is seen, there's a completely different viewpoint of, of what the relationship is going to be. To, so to see Liberians actually moving in and doing that has been awesome. Um, we're a part of an umbrella group called Liberia Mercy Partners. And through that, um, there's a church in Liberia called uh, uh, Community, Community Church Ministries. Um, and they actually are, they, they started in Guinea during the war. And then they came to Liberia and established um, a community of churches. And they are now actually sending minis- missionaries into an unreached people group in Guinea, which is a neighboring country. And it's been really cool to see them taking the initiative and doing that and us being able to stand back and be an encouragement and be kind of a, an uplifting kind of push to say, you guys are doing great, you know, and to, to really help them when they have questions. But they've done amazing work um, and we get to be involved in that as well. Um, so um, going down into the compassion side, um, we do do this as a business. Um, we don't, our business does not really make any profits. Um, it's a pretty much a break-even business. We try to keep prices as low as possible for other ministries to do their work because a lot of our projects have to do with other ministries, either building their, um, building their own infrastructure um, or building, helping to build churches for Liberians. Um, we've built, we've built uh, community centers. Um, we've built schools. We, we've built uh, some dorm rooms for uh, a Christian college in Liberia. Um, uh, we've built, we've built homes. Uh, one of the really cool things that we are hoping to be able to do, and we've actually started this last year, um, was uh, we had we actually did make a, a, some profits in our organization. And all of those profits were then put towards uh, building a home for a woman uh, that was in serious need. Her house was actually falling down in the rain. It was getting literally melted in the rain because of it was just a mud house. And she had, um, she had worked and volunteered in an orphanage for many years that we know of. Um, and so um, somebody came to us and asked if we could bless her. And so we were able to actually, our, our teams, I actually was not... I, I was not there to touch any of the project. Our teams were able to actually go and build this house. And many of our employees actually um, donated their time. They were not paid to do this work because they saw, wow, we did this, and, and our organization made the profits, and now we get to be a part of helping our own people. We don't have to ask somebody else. We don't have to reach out, but we get to be a part of it. That was really cool to be a part of as well, and we are really hoping and planning to do more of that in the future. Um, along with trying to include other people from the states in, in maybe helping to sponsor a portion of those homes being built. Um, so uh, these are just a, a couple of pictures of our team. Again, um, as you can see, these are just some, some pictures on the top left and bottom right. These are some of our Bible studies that we've done. Um, we, treat it, we treat our Bible studies more like a home church. Um, some a lot of our a lot of our employees and a lot of the people that we serve um, see themselves as Christians, 
but a lot of them are not a part of a church, or if they are a part of a church, it's it's um, it's a, not a very healthy church. And so we kind of use um, use our Bible studies almost as a home church, um, but we use the inductive Bible study uh, method, which is um, <clears throat> um, I'm having a brain fart. Uh, the inductive Bible study method. What's that? Yeah, so we're going through the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and looking at the context of the Bible and finding out what is, again, like I talked about in the, in the message, what are, what, who is writing it, who is receiving it, what are they actually trying to say, and how can we apply that to our life? Um, and so we're using that, and we actually allow, uh, usually allow them to lead most of the Bible study, and we just kind of help to encourage them. Um, and we've been able to bring out a lot of sinful stuff and a lot of wrongful thinking just in doing those Bible studies, and, and uh, it's, been, it's been really great. Um, so actually, I'm going to move back. Um, so that's actually what we get to be involved in. Another cool thing for us, um, again, Liberia is very much what I had talked about, very much individual and kind of broken apart within the church. And so you have a lot of churches that are uh, that are built like right across the street from each other and they kind of compete with each other on who can play the loudest music or who can have the most people and, and things like that. And it's a competition that seems funny, but it's actually really dangerous um, because it really has divided the church in Liberia and there's a lot of, um, lot of competition into, oh, you're going to that church, well, you need to come to my church. Oh, you're going to that church, well, they're, they're not correct, you need to come to my church. And so it's, um, it's, it's, um, it's not healthy um, at all. And so um, we actually get to be a part of kind of connecting and coming together and grouping because um, we're not necessarily associated in the ministry that we do. We're not associated with a certain church in Liberia. So we actually get to work with um, and try to help other churches come together. We do have a home church uh, in Liberia that Jess and I are a part of. Um, but as as far as our ministry, we get to work with so many other churches and so many other ministries and literally help to bring that divide together. We've even seen that in in the missionary organi- uh, in the missionary community that a lot of missionaries are in Liberia and there's many that have been there for for a long time and they they have no idea who else is there and what else is being done. And so um, because of kind of what we do and how we help ministries and missionaries, we get to actually go and be a part of that, and we get to include them and introduce them to the other people that we've met and what they're doing. We get to help, uh, maybe in our own way, help them to come together and be a part of the greater body and be able to uh, to have kind of one mission and one um, one goal in reaching Liberia and then reaching the rest of the countries. Um, so I am gonna I am gonna quit babbling um, before I go into this. Um, I want to open it up, and Jess, I'm even going to, Jessica's going to hate me, but please also ask if you have questions for Jessica. I'd like to open it up for any type of questions, um, young people, elderly people, if you have any questions, um, everybody in between, um, we'd love to answer any questions you have, whether it be, okay, we have a question back there already. Okay, so in our home, uh, we started out that way. Um, we lived in a uh, right in the community in a very populated place of Liberia. They call it the red light district. Um, huge market, uh, and we lived pretty close to that. Jess and I did. Um, and yes, we went to the to the uh, to the local market every day to get our food. A lot of times, it was it was rotten meat and uh, and with flies all over it and things like that, but um, but we felt at that point we felt like we really needed to be a part of that community and understand how their culture works. So we spent a lot of our first years, uh, year maybe two years, um, living in the community, being a part of the community, and just doing what everybody else does to understand, truly understand how their culture works. And that's how we really un- started to understand how their communities are knit together. Um, and so, yes, we did go to the market every day. Now, um, after having kids and after, uh, we, after starting this business, we, so we were living with a Liberian family. Um, and after we started this business, p- 
people, the, the thieves and rogues started uh, seeing us a little bit more and started seeing uh, where we were living. And we kind of painted a target on the backs of the people that we were living with. And um, in the last kind of few months that we were living with them, um, we and they were broken into several times, uh, once a week sometimes. Um, our house was broken into several times. Um, my, our vehicle was, was broken into and a lot of stuff taken out of it. And so um, for the safety of, at that time, Job, who had just come into our house uh, uh, as we were fostering him, um, for the safety of our child and then any of our future children, and also the safety of the family we lived with, we ended up moving into another area where, um, where we were able to get a solar array and we now have a wall kind of around where we live. And, uh, and so we do have a freezer now and electricity, so we don't have to go to the market every day. Um, but we definitely do still um, try uh, to go because that's where a lot, of, a lot of life happens in Liberia. So go ahead. Can somebody... Uh, there is not persecution of the church in Liberia. Uh, because Liberian is seen as a Christian country right now, um, one of the things that we see, though, is there is an infiltration of, of the Muslim belief in Liberia. And so one of the... Muslims don't... Muslims don't evangelize. One of the things that they do is they, they essentially come in and they populate the area, and then once they have the majority... Um, then they make, have the decision-making power. And so we kind of see that happening. We see the Muslim countries kind of coming in. We see the, the Middle Eastern countries coming in and kind of trying to establish that. So um, right now it's about 50% Muslim, 50% Christian. Um, but I would say even at that, there, there's a lot of, mar- uh, a lot of, um, a lot of Christians that, that don't have a true relationship with Jesus. It's very religious um, and there's a lot of Muslims that are the same way. So we actually come in contact with a lot of Muslims that would say, well, I'm a Muslim just because my family's a Muslim. And so when we try to introduce Jesus, they'll come back and say, um, well, so if I accept Jesus, does that mean I'm calling my father a liar? And again, if you look into their cultural context, into their collective context, that's a big deal to call your father a liar. And so, um, so that's something that's, that's, that we really have to deal with. Um, but as far as persecution of Christians in Liberia, no, there is not. Yes, uh, slowly. Slowly we're seeing that growth. Um, one of the stories I'll share, um, he's actually not a part of our crew anymore, but he was a part of our original Bible, Bible group. Um, his name is McGill. I don't think I have any pictures of McGill. I thought, I'd, I, thought I shared it, but anyways, um, uh, McGill was a part of our original Bible study, and as, um, as we started in our original Bible study, we were reading through the early church and what it actually meant to be a church, and they picked up on Right away, they picked up on the fact that the church was actually serving each other, and they were serving their communities. And so they started serving their communities. Fast forward to one of our projects, uh, McGill actually decided he wanted to come with us, um, and he came with us and helped us uh, on our project. And um, at that point, we had left, and he said, well, I want to stay here. Um, And he actually just started doing service for people in that village. And he started, you know, cleaning the grass on the, on the, uh, the path, uh, walking path and things like that. And people actually started asking him, why are you doing this? And he was able to actually start a small Bible study himself without us really pushing. And I remember, I remember him calling us and saying, hey, do you have any, do you have any uh, uh, information or books on, on how to read? Because there's people that are coming to me that don't know how to read, so I need to teach them how to read. So... Um, so yes, we're seeing that little by little, and that's what we're encouraging. Um, so that's been really cool to see as well, because I think at the end of the day, our 
our goal um, in Liberia, just so everybody knows, our goal is not to be there forever. Um, our goal is to start something that can be continued, that can be operated and run, um, and that Liberians can take ownership of, uh, especially with the ministry, and to be able to be an encouragement to help them um, continue to reach their own people. Yeah. <laughs> um, the women I actually had more difficulty with. Um, the women are, they often are in their home. So they'll go to the market or they'll send <coughs> their children to the market to go get food and then they'll cook, do the cleaning, um, all the things in the house. And so um, one of the things I learned early on was I had to go to them um, because they didn't have time to come to a Bible study. And so oftentimes we would walk in the evenings when they were more free. Um, and the thing that they would do normally then is phone call um, to their friends and family. And so that was the time where we would kind of walk around at dusk <laughs> and just meet with people and just see what they were struggling with and meet them kind of where they were. Um, yeah, and also like Jesse had mentioned too, was in the market, um, creating those relationships in the market um, with women who were selling or um, in the schools also was another thing that we learned was the mothers are more so involved with the children. And so anything within the school, the mothers were there. Um, and so that was another aspect that we were able to reach out and then becoming a mother, that was kind of an added bonus <laughs> um so being able to share experiences and um they would give me advice and then i was able to give them advice also and yeah then they're very involved in the church um and so oftentimes when jesse would preach because it is more of a male dominated country i guess i'll say um they oftentimes the women were quiet they were in the back they did the singing and then that was it and so oftentimes Jesse was invited to preach and he would often speak to what it was to honor your wife and to include her and to be heard and how do you communicate you know with your wife and involve her in family issues but also um as I don't want to say head of the home, but as a piece of the home um, to be involved. And yeah, recently with having three children now, we'll see how <laughs> the Lord decides to use me as an example or just um, in the short little times I do get to visit um, Jesse on the field. So, Any other questions for Jessica? Um, so mainly it's a rice um, country. So they would make kind of, they call it a soup, but we would say more of, yeah, I guess we could call it a sauce. Um, so they would pick greens, different kinds of greens. So one of the more popular ones is sweet potato. So they don't often keep the sweet potato. They would sell the sweet potato because it's worth more. And then they would take the greens um, the leaves, thank you, um, cut them up and fry them. And then they would put that on top of their rice with oil. And that's a majority of what we eat. And then very small amounts of protein, mostly fish. Oh, she's adding lots of pepper. It's very spicy food. Well, that's it. No, um, so we actually have been in the States. We were, um, 
surprisingly evacuated out of the country because of COVID in April. So we actually have been in the States since April of last year. Um, it's been very difficult um, to be away from our home for that long and to be away from our people for that long. Uh, it's been great to be able to spend time with family and have a newborn baby and it's been awesome. But um, so we actually are going back um, in April. Um, so we actually have tickets to head back. Um, and yeah, the probably the biggest adjustment will be having three children instead of just two. Um, it was hard enough having two children. Um, just <laughs> all of the things involved. It's really hard to, um, I think Jessica could speak to this as well. It's, it's really hard to uh, find find people that you can trust that can watch the children, um, that you can really trust that that they're going to take care of them like you would like them to be taken care of. Um, and so a lot of times wherever we go or if usually it's either I'm going somewhere or we all go together. Um, and, and Jessica has had to adapt a lot more to staying at home with the children. Um, until we're able to find somebody that that we can really trust to watch our children because you know that's you know for us I think it's it actually brings up a funny story like for us um, and this is a cultural thing for us we we would do any like we would do anything for the safety of our children right we hold our children very close and very dear um, and so if we had a choice between let's say our money or our children we would choose our children in Liberia, not necessarily that they would choose money over their children, but it's, yeah, their children are an investment. And it's a, so a lot of times we, you'll see that people will literally just, like if their children are in, if our family has children in, in the, the bush, in the village, and they have an aunt or uncle or somebody that's close, they will send their children to the city for long periods of time and maybe not see them for long periods of time. And even in a, even in a small sense, like if they go somewhere, like if, I, if we were to go visit somewhere and we were Liberian, we would literally just hand our children off to whoever was in the community and they would go, go in the community while we do our business and then they would come back. And so one of the things, like for them, they would say, you can take my child, but I don't, I, I'll trust you with my child, but I won't trust you with my money. For us, we would trust anybody, not anybody, we would more trust somebody with our money than with our child. And so that's a big difference for us in trying to, to kind of balance that and understand like we actually have this, like we don't trust too many people with our children. Um, and so um, that's a little bit of a difficulty, but. Uh, lots of trouble, yes. So um, he asked if we had trouble sourcing materials and sourcing parts. So it's been a hard, it's been really hard for me as far as materials because um, there's different materials available. So it's not the materials that I think we should have, but having to adjust and understand that they actually do have materials to provide, but we just have to learn the best ones to use. Um, and then as far as materials for the, for the block machines themselves, um, it's, that's probably our biggest expense, our biggest operating expense, and that is keeping those machines operating because in Liberia we have, we have um, terrible fuel, dirty fuel, we have dirty oil, we have uh, high temperatures, we have, um, uh, we have humidity and rust, you know, we were right by the ocean, so we have salt, uh, salt in the air that's rusting everything. And so we go through a lot of steel parts. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of expense there in getting stuff shipped over. But um, but we've been able to kind of uh, establish the business in a way that those are just kind of part of the operating cost of how it works. Um, as far as like materials, the cool thing, and thank you for asking that because this brings me, um, we actually do purchase m all of our materials, if not most, if not all, from. Uh, companies that are run by Lebanese uh, owners. 
And it's not that we meant to do this or that we were trying to do this, but it's just how it worked out. But the really cool part is, is that the relationship that I am able to have with those Lebanese owners is a completely different relationship from what they're used to, right? Because a lot of times, um, you know, their interaction with American missionaries or whatever has really been in evangelism and people trying to evangelize and things like that. With me, I'm doing business with these people. And so there's a relationship that I get to be involved in. Like we have, um, uh, I get to actually sit down and talk about, you know, and create friendships with these people and be able to understand how I can speak into their life. Uh, we had, I have one really good friend who's actually Syrian uh, who runs a business uh, that we bought our first motorcycle from. Jess and I didn't have a vehicle originally uh, for the first two or three years, and so we actually rode around everywhere on a motorcycle and uh, bought that, kind of established that relationship, and anytime I was in the area, I would go visit. And anytime we came back from the States, I would bring him chocolate or something, and we would just sit down and talk. And we never really got to talk about, um, you know, mostly it was just a friendship, just establishing friendship. And about a year and a half ago or two years ago, um, we, we, Jess and I both went there and sat down, and it was like all of a sudden he started asking questions about what I believe. And so because of that friendship that was established, um, we were able to, uh, I was able to, I actually bought him an Arabic Bible, and he bought me a, an English Koran, and we've actually been able to discuss um, about that so many times. So it's been really cool, and the, the journey is still continuing with him, but it's the same with those, the relationships that I have in other areas. I had another Lebanese organization. We were sitting down, and they're like, so wait a minute. So you're doing this business, but you're not getting paid from the business. And, you know, and he's like, I, I'm not understanding because all they do is make money. That's all they want to do is make money in Liberia. So, um, so then, of course, and I said, because I follow Jesus, because Jesus asks us to go and he asked me to go here and I am. And so um, just little things like that in those relationships has been really, really great uh, with our, uh, the source of our materials and things. Ooh. Uh, okay, yeah, you're, you, is this a good day? Jessica said you're only supposed to ask that on a good day because there's many things that we are very frustrated with about their culture. We don't, it's very different and it's, it's just, it, it is very uncomfortable to, to clash with and deal with, but I will say that we are constantly learning and adapting and adjusting and understanding that there are parts of their culture that are very biblical, that our culture is not. And so one of those things, I think, is that collective mentality. It's difficult for us, me even still, to kind of deal with that because um, so many times I, I find myself trying to, uh, trying to um, teach somebody my individualistic culture and try to teach them, well, this is yours and you should, you know, like my uh, Joseph, my right-hand man, you know, he gets a salary from us and um, he, co he comes to me constantly and says, can, can, you just, can you just keep some of this money because I know for later, because I know that if I have it, I will give it to my family or I, I will give it to my community, right? And, and so for me, I'm like, Joseph, this is your money. You have to, you have to handle this with care, you know, you have to put it in the bank, you have to, and he's, he, he just said, I can't do that, and I, I could not quite understand, and I thought that was so wrong that he would not be able to take care of his own finances, but then as, as, as you live in the, in the culture, and you understand, like, for the first year, Jess and I did not, uh, did not give money to anybody while we, were, while we were there, there was a lot of people that asked for money, we said, we can't give, give money to you, because we don't know what the cultural and the relational um, boundaries need to be. And so we wanted to live there and understand what the boundaries were before we got involved. And the one thing that we saw constantly in our community, if somebody was sick and anybody was walking by, anybody, didn't even have to be family, they would come and visit and they would say, oh, I'm sorry you're sick, and they would give them some money to go buy medicine. And so there's this collective mentality about them that they are a unit, they're a group. Um, that 
that I that I, I think there's portions of it that I really love. I really love this idea that we're all here to help each other. We're all here to build each other up. To, um, Of course, there have been some very individualistic stuff that has leaked into the culture from the American, um, from our American culture. But for the most part, their, 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 um, their group or community culture is actually really cool to be involved in. Yeah, so there is an established education. There's a there's an edu education ministry in the Liberian government that kind of um, gives standards, but most of those standards are not really met. So I would say there is education. Um, a large majority of the schools are private schools that are being built by churches or other organizations um, that kind of they 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 follow the government standards as far as uh, as far as they want to, and then they they pay off the inspector for anything else. So a lot of standards aren't really being met. Um, so that's why a lot of ministries that we know of are like, well, we don't want to we don't want to use this other school. We want to establish our own because they feel like, well, our school is going to be more, you know, going to be able to provide more, going to be able to do this. Um, so yes, there's a there's actually a lot of schools in Liberia. Um, there's, I, I don't know the percentage, but there is a large majority, not a large majority, there's a large population of children that are not being educated. Um, one is financial reasons, because the schools do charge um, tuition and uh, lots of different fees here and there and stuff, just to be able to pay their teachers and what have you. Um, and even schools that they, they say are free schools end up paying some kind of fees to be able to have their children in. And so a lot of families usually have to choose one of their children or two of their children to go to school and then the rest will stay home. Um, and so, um, so yeah, that's, that's a serious problem and people are trying to fix that. Um, people are trying, we, we know of a lot of people that, are, that have built schools or learning centers in Liberia. We've built actually several. Um, but I would say it's more scattered in terms of standardization. It's very much kind of like, we built our school and we built our school and we built our school and so there are a, a lot of really more private schools that are kind of teaching their own curriculums. Yeah, so... Are you a construction man? No. Okay, so you sound like a construction man. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah, so uh, the home that we built, uh, it was a 500-square-foot house, two bedrooms and very uh, standard home, um, was a, a around $16,000 to build. Um, and um, so... That being aside, as far as getting bids, uh, we, I originally I started off and we started off and saying we just wanted to focus on the production and be kind of like a just be a provider to Liberia to be able to just retail and purchase our bricks. And then we realized there was a huge um, quality control problem where we could give you the best building material in the world, but if you don't know how to build with it or if you think you know but you're terrible at it, then it, it comes back on us. And so that's whenever we actually start, I actually started um, uh, kind of general contracting, so taking care of the whole project. And then yes, taking bids um, or estimates from other builders. Um, and since then I had, I had three that I've, that I've worked with before and I've actually basically honed it down to just one builder that I use and that's Guza. Um, Guza has several crews, and I've been able to establish a good enough relationship with him as of right now for him to have the trust with me to be able to tell me exactly what it's going to cost. A lot of times uh, in Liberia, and I know in other third world countries, uh, in Haiti as well, because we have a, uh, some people that do the same thing that we do in Haiti, um, that the contractors, in order to get the job, they will bid it probably like a quarter of the cost. 
And then once you get into it, they say, well, I don't have this and this and this and this and this and this. And by the time it's done, you've spent like four times more on the house, but you're pretty much stuck with the builder. And so, um, so I've been able to build that relationship with this contractor where he knows he can tell me the exact cost and I'll, I'm going to pay it if we get the job, you know. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's another big relationship thing that, um, that trust is not established until there's a relationship. And so when I do get estimates and bids from other builders, I know that I automatically have to add 50% or 75% to whatever they told me it was. Um, but it's communication. And we tell this to our, to our, our, our teams all of the time in order to be able to operate correctly. Um, that a husband and wife, even choosing to be together, have to communicate all of the time or else that relationship starts to, starts to break a little bit. And so how much more do we have to communicate when we are coming from completely different cultures? So we have to talk until we're tired of talking and then we have to talk some more and continue to communicate. So... Yeah, so um, so it's actually doing really well. I would say um, I would say we while we're there, we get to actually do a lot more ministry, um, and so the ministry side of things is a little bit slow. Um, there's still devotions happening, and there's still things like that happening, um, but a lot of the workshops and stuff don't get done without me being there. But as far as the, the business is concerned, um, our, our teams have done an excellent job. Uh, we've actually, um, since we left in April, they've started and completed three different projects um, and gotten really good reports back from the customers on that. And so I, I still am very much involved with the overall um, project and everything. I do a lot of the communication with the customer um, and then I am talking lots of over the phone and over Facebook Messenger and things to my to my people to make sure everything is being done right. But our team, as far as the business is concerned, has done really, really well. Um, right. So I yeah. So so yeah. So I run the business more. I'm I, I haven't been able to hand that over. So as far as the 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 finances and the communication with the customers, I still do that. Um, I'm trying to teach Joseph how to do that, but it's going to take time. But as far as the construction and the actual operation goes, they pretty much have been able to run and take take it over. I am, I'm, I I'm a jack of all trades. So uh, my dad, um, my dad. Uh, was in construction. He was a trim carpenter. Um, and then I actually am an electrician by trade. Um, so I, I did for three years before we left, I did uh, residential um, electrical work. And so I actually worked in plumbing, electrical, framing, that kind of stuff. I had never done anything with masonry, which is all they do over there, building with bricks. Um, and so I had to self self teach a little bit on that using YouTube and what have you. But I did actually come back uh, as I talked about with our block machines, I came back to Texas um, to the organization, to the company there, and they actually did a training that helped me to kind of learn the the basics of of this material. Um, but other other than that, it's been it's been a trial and error and learning as we go type of a situation. Um, usually, it's me. Um, I also have, uh, I'm pretty good with the, with the design software. Um, I have, um, I have some people in Liberia, some engineers in Liberia, as well as here in the States that have been able to look at some of the projects for me and make sure that it's structural. Um, um, but as far as the design, uh, a lot of times I, I encourage the customers to find somebody else to do the design. Um, but I tell them if, if you if you don't have the money or if you you know that kind of stuff, just tell me what you think you need and I can give you a basic idea. You know, it's not going to be perfect. It's going to be square. It's going to be straight, but it might not be quite as architectural as you would like. But a lot of people are completely fine with that. Um, so after the meeting, what do you look to do in the 
So I use Google SketchUp. It's a software that's a, a simpler version of AutoCAD. Um, a lot of people use it with uh, 3D um, printing and stuff, but Google SketchUp is awesome for construction design, for 3D uh, um, rendering and stuff like that. Um, we, in Liberia, it's crazy because they use all of the different measurements. So I use inches and feet, and but a lot of, they have, I mean, our crews sometimes will bring out tape measures that have millimeters and centimeters, and I'm like, what are you, what are you measuring? What are you doing here? So they actually work with all, all of the different measurements, and we have to kind of standardize. So I standardize with inches and feet, mostly. Um, sometimes it has to change here and there, but. What kind of sports? That's a good question. Um, so there's two main sports, soccer, which is football, not soccer. I, I still, you know, growing up here, we, we think, oh, it's football. But then everybody, they always come like, why do you call it football? So soccer um, is, is the main game that the, that the boys play. Um, and the girls play what they call baseball, which is a version of kickball for us. Um, so they essentially, it's essentially kickball. Um, some girls will play soccer, um, but most of the time the girls are playing kickball and the boys are playing soccer. So that's, those are the two main sports that are played. There's some very small groups. Um, the YMCA actually has an organization there that has a gym and they do, they have like a small basketball, um, kind of deal, but that's main, mainly it's soccer and, and kickball. Well, we don't have a summer. We, it's always summer in Liberia. Um, we're just about 10 degrees above the equator, so it's always hot. Um, we have two seasons in Liberia. We have rainy and we have dry. Um, so we have six months out of the year that it rains usually nonstop for a week at a time, and you get about a break, and then it rains again, just complete deluge of water. Uh, Monrovia is actually, at, I don't know if it's, I don't know this year, um, but last year Monrovia was actually the wettest city in the world as far as rainfall. Um, but then there's another six months out of the year that is completely dry to the point that wells dry up, um, um, any gardens that you have dry up because it gets completely dry. Um, but as far as temperature, um, the hottest it gets is you know in the in the single digits over a hundred um, and the coldest that we've experienced mid seventies and that was in I was up in the the higher kind of mountains of Liberia in northern Liberia where it got down to mid seventies and we were like, "Wow, this is nice um, but the other thing is is that um, that really only the privileged people have air conditioning, and so um we actually, I was just able for Jessica's, no, for Christmas, for Jessica, I bought an air conditioner that I put in our room when I went back this last time, but we won't be able to run it very often because we have solar and that doesn't work very well on solar, but anyways, um, the so it's really hot and we don't have air conditioning, and so that's the kind of the major problem. When you get in your house, um, it's very... Uh, you have to have some kind of fans or air movement because it just gets super hot inside. Yeah. Uh, I still play the drums, yes. Um, do I play them in Liberia? No. Um, so the... The rhythm in Liberia is very different. You don't have straight up 4-4 four, four or 3-4 or um, if, I mean, you can, you can uh, YouTube some Liberian uh, songs and stuff, but it's, the rhythm is very, so much off. And I actually tried originally, I brought, um, uh, I brought a couple, I brought a different, some different drums that I tried to play with them and they just hated the way that I played. And so, you know, I just was like, all right, fine. I, this is not, but when I do come back, I like to, I actually haven't 
um, been able to been able to drum this time coming back, but most of the time I usually come back and. Uh, but yes, so I am very out of practice. So I don't I don't know if I want to uh, <laughs> I don't know if I want to compete there, but I do still love to drum. It's it's a passion of mine. Yes. Whew. Uh, yes, we have hospitals. They are not hospitals like you would imagine, like the one here in Oskaloosa or in Pella. Or, um, very, uh, how, do I, how do I say this? Yeah, so in these, in these hospital settings, um, you usually have to go and buy your own uh, medicine, your own materials. So, um, for instance, Joseph, last year, year and a half ago, had a really serious motorcycle accident. And before they would do anything for him, uh, one of us actually had to leave the hospital and go to a pharmacy in the city and buy him gauze and, um, and bandages and things like that. He had a complete compound fracture. So the, the service is a lot different. Um, uh, I would say the other thing is you have to pay before your service and not after. Uh, of course, the cost is a lot less than what we pay here. Um, Usually, let's see, we had, uh, Joseph was able to get a surgery to put put a steel rod in his leg, and I think we ended up paying no more than $300 for that to get done. But $300 for us is nothing. $300 for them is is the end of the world. He might as well just die. Um, so those are some, I mean, for us, it's like, that. wow, that's super cheap, but for them, it's, it's the end of the world. Um, so a lot of times we see um, or we get requests from families that somebody had an accident or somebody this, and the whole family then has to come and, and pile together money. And especially if they're in the village, they have to actually drive from the village in a taxi a day or a couple of days to get to Monrovia to be able to pay before their family member will even be able to be seen. Um, there are some exceptions. There's, there's a couple of different clinics and missions hospitals. So Samaritan's Purse actually built a hospital um, pretty recently, or rebuilt a hospital um, in Liberia. Uh, they still have a pay before before your your scene kind of a situation, um, but they they do have exceptions. Of course, they do have exceptions where if it's a life or death situation, they will take you in. And um, yeah, but uh, I was I did not know how bad the hospital system was in Liberia until Joseph had that accident. And it, it absolutely made me sick. And I'm not going to describe everything that happened because there's, there's children here. But um, just take my word for it. It was terrible. You do not want to end up in one of those hospitals. Was there a what? A greenhouse? I mean... For plants, some people have greenhouses. Yes. Yeah. So they yeah. So they they usually for planting stuff they normally do like a nursery, which is essentially like a greenhouse, where they'll they'll start them from seed and they keep them covered so that the the deluge of rain or the hot sun won't burn them up. Um, yeah. But then instead of using like like uh, you know plastic like we normally do, they would use like palm branches to cover it up and allow a little bit of sunlight to come through. So, Yeah, um, <clears throat> so I would say the most important thing, and Jessica may, may have something different, but for us, I think the most important thing is to, is for you, if, if you're involved with a missionary, or if you're involved with missionaries, to yourself be actively involved in, in what they're involved in. And so, um, a lot of times, a lot of times missionaries um, go around and speak to lots of different people, and people are really 
interested in what they're doing and and they get connected and even the ones that decide to financially support which is excellent i mean we always need financial support for what we're doing um you you become to feel very alone because you get over to the country and then like people i think there's this expectation of of you to report what you're doing to other people but there's never this expectation of them kind of coming alongside and asking you how are you guys doing how you know and so i think it's a good question because um because I don't have the answer for everybody because everybody kind of needs are different. But if, if you are personally or if you as a church are supporting missionaries, um, I think it's always good to, to actually schedule time to or just remember to, to regularly send them a message and say, hey, we're thinking about you. Hey, we're praying for you. Um, what in this season of your life are you in need of? What, how can we support you? And I think, so that question is probably something to continue to ask. For us, I think in this season right now, um, uh, definitely I would say, I would say people being, uh, being involved in kind of sending and asking us, how are you guys doing? Um, a lot of times when you get into the thick of some crazy stuff that happens, which we have been in, we've had lots of, lots of sickness with our kids and lots of sickness with us. And then we had a had a, a evacuation flight in a cargo plane to America, and then we had a hospitalization of our young daughter, and just like so many crazy things were happening, and we got to the point where we're like, we don't even know what to say to people. We don't even know, like we don't even know what we're going through, and so having people to to reach out to us would be would be amazing. Having people that go, we'd really like to pray for you. What are some specific things we can pray for you, or how how can we? Re- how can what can we be doing to to support you in what you're doing? So um, that would be it. Um, so how can you be a part of what we're doing? Um, so to finish up, I know you all need to get to lunch. Um, so Jess and I raise support for our family, um, and over the last two years, we've grown our family from two to five, and so um, our monthly support is pretty low at this point doesn't really change anything. We're going back to Liberia, but we, um, we've we been challenged to be bold. Um, a lot of times we don't. We aren't quite as bold in asking for financial support ourselves. We really like to come and do the, do the ministry and like to share about what we're doing, but a lot of times we don't really um, um, ask. Um, and so we would just ask um, maybe um, if you have a group of people, a family or a couple or if as, as a church, um, if this would be something that you would like to be involved in with supporting our family and what we do in Liberia, um, that's definitely a way you can, you can be a part. If you'd like to have a cross-cultural experience, we'd love for you to come visit and to see how we live and to see how Liberians live and to maybe yourself get a different perspective on the world. Um, and so we'd love to have you come visit and see what's going on. Um, if you're if you're interested in what we're doing, tell others about it. Be like, hey, somebody came to my church. They're doing this really awesome thing. Um, share our website, whatever, because there's so many, there's, you never know who will be interested in, in uh, a different type of ministry. Um, also in the visiting, I would really encourage people that feel like um, uh, the first time that I actually went to Liberia, I didn't want to because I was like, I don't really like kids that much. I don't really do the VBS thing. I don't like... I just, it wasn't me, um, it, but it wasn't until I was asked to install a solar unit that I was like, hey, I can do this. I can do that. And so we really would encourage anybody with any type, like looking at your own career and your own skill set, being able to come over and do training, um, do a, like teaching or like a, a week-long training or even a couple days um, is a huge way to impart your knowledge onto others as well as to create that relationship to be able to share Jesus with people. And you never know when that relationship can come. So um, I would really encourage you, if it's not Liberia, if it's somewhere else, looking at your own, kind of your own expertise and how God has prepared you for your life and being able to impart that knowledge and that wisdom onto others is huge. It's not just about doing VBS. It's not just about um, doing church camps and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's about everyday life as well. Um, and also, of course, the most important part, please be praying. Um, if, there, if it's nothing else, we ask that you continue to pray because um, 
because the deceiver is everywhere. Um, here in Liberia, there's some serious spiritual warfare going on in Liberia um, for the souls of its people. And so we just ask you to constantly be praying for the Holy Spirit to be preparing the way for us. We ask you to constantly be praying um, um, praying that, that he would show us what we should be doing and that we would have the courage to follow and do it. Um, so the other thing, um, if you guys want to, uh, we don't have any handouts for you. I didn't get anything printed out. Um, but uh, we have our website for the lamb liberiacom um, if you want to look that up. Also on Facebook and Instagram, mo- most of you young people, even a lot of you old people have Facebook um, you can just look us up, just go up in the search and look for, look for For the Lamb, spelled out For the Lamb. Um, and we have our Facebook page there. If you want to um, check us out and see what we're doing, um, there's also ways that you can donate and ways that you can get involved uh, that way as well. Um, uh, Susan is actually uh, a part of our uh, financial support group. And so if you'd like to have, if you have any other questions also and we're not here and you don't, don't know how, what to do, you can go and talk to Susan. She didn't. Uh, she, she didn't uh, tell me. She didn't volunteer for this, but I am volunteering her for this. Uh, thank you, Susan, for asking us to come uh, to come and be a part of this as well. Um, uh, but again, uh, you can talk to me after after this, or or go to our website, and and we'd love for you guys to get involved as well. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. We'll uh, close in, in praying for you guys and uh, God's blessing. But Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much that uh, we could have this missions event and have Jesse and his family here with us today. And what a privilege it is just to, uh, Lord, hear what you are doing in and through their lives and, and ministering to the people of Liberia and just uh, hearing the testimony of how you made that happen and just the confirmation of the, the machines being donated and, and the phone calls and it's just awesome to hear God at work, you at work, Lord. We pray for your blessing on them and their uh, Jesse and his family as they head back to Liberia, Lord, in April. Help them to get reestablished, reconnected and settled and just uh, be a powerful witness for Christ in that community. We pray for your protection to be upon them. We ask that you would provide all of their needs, Lord, financial needs, uh, spiritual needs, health needs, and may the body of Christ here in the States um, just gather around them and support them and, and be an encouragement to them as they step out in faith and do the work that uh, you have called them to do. Thank you so much. In Christ's name, amen.